Okay, let's start. Hello and welcome to the Manager Q Sprint 78 review. Uh, this was a standard uh, two week sprint. Next slide, please. Um, as usual, I will go over the uh, sprint statistics. Carol will give us an update on the community, Harpreet on the UI, Ohad on the V2V effort. Uh, providers will be uh, several people giving an update. Uh, Tina will give us an update on Automate. Uh, Greg T on the platform, Alberto on the REST API, Chris Arcand on the GraphQL API that we're developing, and uh, Chris B on documentation. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the sprint we had uh, a good spread of pull requests merged uh, across uh, the classic repo, the core repo. Um, the integration tests uh, seems like a pretty common pattern that we've been seeing lately, so um, it kind of looks all good here. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, we've seen a, a downturn in the number of pull requests merged, I think, as we're focusing on uh, bugs in your British Feely. Um, not that many new enhancements are being uh, Developer completed, and I think more are happening on the bug side. Next slide, please. One second, Oleg, just checking something. Sure. Okay. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so as you can see there, there are 40, almost half were uh, bug fixes, uh, only 16% were enhancements, uh, roughly 16% on documentation and 10% uh, on tests. Um, so pretty expected spread here um, as we're heading into the late stages of uh, releasing the print really. Next slide, please. On the repository health, uh, no uh, major changes to note. I think everything is uh, steady as she goes here. Um, um, we'll continue monitoring uh, the health of the various repos. Next slide, please. All right, over to Carol. All right, thanks. Thanks, Oleg. <clears throat> so, um, Carol here. So, uh, uh, I feel really bad because I was supposed to make this nice big announcement about the Dublin Dutch Village uh, GA, and uh, it's mostly ready. We have the images built and not tested, but uh, <clears throat> I'm still. Uh, I've been fighting a cold since uh, DEF CON last weekend, so uh, I haven't been uh, able to complete it in time for this sprint. Uh, but I didn't want to wait two, two uh, weeks later to, to share this information, so I, I added this here and uh, uh, wait for the announcement in a social channel near you very soon. So, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. And uh, in relation to the release, we have the uh, user reference guide uh, updated on the website um, built and uh, it's automatically built now uh, when the website updates and thanks uh, David for um, making that happen putting the work for that and speaking of events um, we had a pretty uh, nice uh, DEF CONF um, in Brno over the weekend uh, if you're interested there's a little recap there and uh, again, thanks to David and uh, some of the other engineers uh, who are there to help uh, share and promote Manage IQ. We've got some interesting discussions and good feedback. And then there's one coming up uh, this weekend in Brussels in this Fostum. And um, so it's again over the weekend and uh, we don't have a booth, but I'm hoping to uh, either, you know, with Obeard or some of the, uh, of the other upstream booths and hang around there and uh, talk to people and share. Um, I think the Obeard demo will have Manage IQ um, integrated as well, so we can promote that. Uh, that's it for this week. Thanks, and next slide, please. Hi, everyone. So for user interface, total of 70 PRs were merged in UI repo. Total numbers up there don't match as some of the PRs related to future work had 
other labels such as developer and some of the PRs were test related PRs. So we'll have to look into the labels and um, we are still focusing mainly on fixing blocker bugs. And uh, as you can tell by the PR count, a lot of bugs were fixed. Out of that, some major fixes were made in the advanced search area, mainly to fix saving and using filters in config management, configured systems explorer. And also there were some other minor fixes made in services explorer related to advanced search there. As for future and in progress items, some of our team members are working on V2V efforts that Ohad is leading, and he will give us some insights on that. Part of our team is um, also focusing on moving us towards modern technologies related to JavaScript. So there was some work going on related to adding React JS, Redux, and just support in our product. Also, some work is going on to replace filters in SQL queries with named scopes for building list. This one, uh, the PR that's in uh, not being merged yet is uh, related to building list of MIQ results, requests, I'm sorry. So Martin P is going to talk about that in more details. Um, also, there were some improvements made by Eric and David with regards to quad icons that David is going to talk about. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ohad for V2V efforts. Next slide, please. Thanks, Arpreet. Um, so I want to talk briefly about a new feature called V2V. Um, the idea behind this feature is uh, to transform a large amount of uh, VMs from one provider to another. Uh, the main difference between the current transform VM option we have, for example, uh, today is simply the, the number of VMs. So the realization is that many users have, uh, uh, I don't know, four digits, maybe five digits of uh, VMs, uh, 10,000 VMs, for example. And if someone wants or needs to migrate from one provider to another, that could be a task that could take up to a whole year, if you, even if you migrate, uh, you know, 100 of VMs per day. So the, the, the idea is to create an easy to follow and easy to use uh, workflow to map uh, the resources, map the VMs, and actually migrate them. Um, we, we split this initiative into two steps. We have a short term where we're initially targeting the VMware provider to over provider migration. But in the long term, we could see multi-provider migrations, so, you know, VMware over it. Uh, OpenStack and even KubeVirt, uh, and also across the providers, so from one provider to another, maybe as a disaster recovery or other use cases as well. Um, briefly about the technology, uh, behind the scene we're using a tool called v V2V, written by Richard Jones, um, and wrapped with Ansible playbooks and automate uh, workflows. Um, the we want to, um, as a feature, we want to expose uh, direct mappings, and that's something that got, got merged in 4.6 recently. Uh, Schema-wise, direct mapping of cluster, storage, and networking, and, and effectively all, all major properties between one provider to another, so we can have uh, actual migrations done very easily with very little, if no, user questions asked while migrating. Uh, the new UI is also based as a manager queue UI plugin and is developed using the React, uh, React and Redux technology stack. Uh, if you want to see more details about the actual design, I have a link here. Uh, but I can, if you can go to the next slide, I'll just share quickly uh, a few mock-ups so you can have some, some sort of a concept to it. Um, this is the first step, so the, the, the POC, uh, where we, this is like the landing page where we see currently an empty state. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first step for a user would be to create mapping. And if you can see here, we can we first step start by mapping clusters. Next slide, please. Later on, we continue with mapping uh, uh, networks and so on. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, we are creating uh, the actual uh, migration plan. Next, please, uh, where we select VMs. Initially, we're going to get VMs just from a list instead of having all the logic of filtering and how to get the VMs. 
But then when we have the VMs, we, we will see here where we actually migrate them. And this could be multiple migration plans, meaning each migration plan uh, consists of many VMs that match to that maybe maintenance uh, window or other criteria application specific or whatever that the customer might want to do. And then migrate um, a lot of VMs at the same time and get, you know, obviously uh, see it uh, in a centralized place, get obviously error reporting and other things, uh, and also historical concepts. Uh, that's it, I think. Next slide, please. Well, most of what I have here was already said, so we really focused on getting all the, all the technologies uh, that are needed for the plugins and also for uh, for uh, for other teams that want to integrate with Manage IQ in, so we so we merged state management built on functional paradigms. Let's call Redux. We merged React, the library that has a lot of attention uh, in uh, and a lot of use uh, by other Red Hat projects, and uh, and uh, is supported by Petenfly. We included Jest, which is a modern JavaScript testing framework. Uh, and it's compatible with what we use until now. We also added uh, some linting support for JavaScript and CSS. We are focusing on, on uh, making it uh, very easy for plugin developers and other teams to use, uh, to use uh, modern JavaScript technologies, uh, technologies inside ManageIQ. Next slide, please. I want to shortly mention the work on GTLs. Uh, GTLs, uh, grids, tables, lists uh, are those components that are seen on every other uh, screen in ManageIQ. It's so used to display all kinds of entities and it's backed by the uh, report data interface. We, we have two last PRs from a series of uh, many PRs that uh, were focused on, on uh, removing SQL fragment computations from the UI. Uh, basically, we are decoupling the UI from the core by uh, by defining interfaces in the form of, of scopes on, on models, and we we are uh, now doing the goals, uh, calls uh, through a JSON based uh, JSON based endpoint. So we are moving uh, moving slowly from the server to the browser, <coughs> cleaning up the interface, removing any, any interaction with with session and basically progressing towards stateless interface and later this can be turned uh, into a rest api uh, component or part of the rest api that's all from me uh, next slide please yeah so inside the gtls you might have seen the quad icons uh, basically we changed the way how we render quad icons we modernized it to a json based uh, angular component and while doing so, we got some new features that couldn't be done before. For example, font icons. Now we can use font icons for uh, instead of PNG icons. Uh, also, we added text okay. abbre abbreviation. meeting. <laughs> and uh, a tooltip per quadrant Tell feature. It. So now we are able to show a tooltip for each quadrant, the different one. There is a, they are also resizable and easily styleable. That's all for me. Next slide. You see that, David? I'm oh, sorry. So here is the JSON format for uh, the, the quad icon. Basically, you can uh, specify each quadrant in the middle uh, place. Separately, you feed this JSON to the component and it transacts what's on the left side. Next slide. David, can you tell the people in be behind you to shush? <laughs> I don't think they are behind me. Okay. <laughs> that was not from here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the uh, backend. Uh, Carol is work currently working on extending the model decorators. So we could get the JSON directly from the backend. Uh, it's still work in progress, and after it's done, we can switch to the new component. Next slide. All right. So I'm going to share an update on uh, cloud and new arch providers. 
Adam will talk about infrastructure providers and Rich will give an update on smart state analysis. Slide, please. The most merged pull requests this sprint um, came from the OpenStack uh, provider, uh, followed by Kubert uh, and Kubernetes, and then a handful or two from the rest of the provider repos. All right, so um, Dan fixed um, an issue with Azure provisioning where if the user selected an available IP address and that IP address is not associated with a NIC, we would ignore it and create a new one. We also upgraded to the latest version of the Azure Armrest gem, which is 0 0.5. Uh, in addition to some smart state analysis fixes that Rich will talk about, um, this includes support for Deleting managed disks as part of the virtual machine delete operation. And then on the new Arch provider, uh, we upgraded to version 0 0.19 of the Cupid uh, Proton gem. And this addresses a problem with incremental delays in the new Arch event catcher. So the longer the event catcher was running and the more events it would gather, the longer that delay was. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, OpenStack had the most uh, merged PRs and the majority of them were bug fixes specifically around fixing uh, targeted refresh and deleting OpenStack providers. Recently, James did a lot of work to orchestrate des uh, the destroy of providers and making sure that workers were shut down. OpenStack had a pretty unique uh, deployment case with a mix of multiple managers and providers, so there was a lot of work around there to, to resolve that. Uh, they also implemented graph refresh for the Cinder Storage Manager. Um, so I think all managers on OpenStack now support graph refresh. And on the vCloud side, uh, Miha from Xlabs implemented uh, IP and MAC address collection for the VMware vCloud provider, um, which looks like a small bit, but there's actually is a, a very large PR. He put a lot of work into it, so it's great to get that in. Next slide. And this is pretty cool. So a community contributor, uh, Everett Mulder, I think I said that right, um, he, over the course of a, a month or two, uh, put PRs into the VMware web service broker uh, and managing Q providers VMware to add disk resize support for uh, VM reconfigure. So this is the screenshot he has in the UI. Um, that PR is still uh, pending review, but hopefully we'll get a, a video demo of that next sprint, but basically now instead of just adding and deleting disks, you can change the size of existing disks. And that's it. Okay, uh, for smart state analysis, this sprint we have some fixes across a uh, number of areas. Uh, the first two are actually <clears throat> provider independent and they impacted all providers. Um, evidently, we don't often test canceling a smart state analysis task. Uh, it turns out when you do actually cancel it, depending on its current state, you neglect it to delete any snapshot that was created as part of the smart state analysis process. We have since fixed that. Um, there was a problem um, if there were totally empty partitions associated with the disk of a VM, we would uh, Fail because we didn't expect zero end partitions. That's now fixed. This fix also fixes an issue where if we had ReFS secondary uh, file systems associated with the Windows VM, it would fail as well, even though it wasn't the boot disk. So this particular fix fixed both of those issues, and they were somewhat related. Uh, on the Azure side, um, this was a fairly, it's only one line, but it's fairly uh, significant. Um, this required uh, changes on both uh, smart state code and the Azure Armrest code. Um, as some may recall, we implemented support for the newly introduced managed disks in Azure a few sprints ago, and it turns out some installations reading those disks was fairly slow. Uh, and it turns out we were treating the reads as stateless and we were reacquiring uh, <clears throat> information for every read that we didn't need to. So we implemented a stateful open read close paradigm. <clears throat> and that fed up 
smart state by a factor of 20. Yeah. So that was fairly significant. And uh, that was a really good fix. Um, uh, for, for Amazon, um, there was an issue where we weren't actually passing the user defined categories um, to the agent that resides in Amazon to, to perform the smart agent state analysis. And that meant you really couldn't re retrieve file, specifically requested files and things like that. And we now pass um, all the profile categories defined to the Amazon agent. And uh, that's what the smart state takes. Good morning. We had 25 PRs merged this sprint. Our fearless leader, Greg McCullough, refactored the VM unit code and exposed a new method to the automate service models, giving users the ability to call VM naming from an automate method. In lifecycle provisioning, VM naming runs when the provision task is initially created. Service provisioning uses service dialogues, which can override the VM name. The timing is an issue since the dialogues are processed after task creation. The goal for 5.0 is to move VM naming to task processing, which runs after the service dialog. Bill, we made an initial schema changing, changes, adding tables for the new V2V mass migration. And quoted, we changed the way we calculate active provisions. We look at MIQ requests instead of MIQ queue entries, which gives us a much more accurate quota count. Next slide, please. Lucy added a new event state machine to replace the synchronous refresh. The VM reconfigure event uses the event action refresh sync built-in method, which waits for the completion of the refresh and blocks the worker. The new event state machine replaces a built-in method, which is, uses a retry for the the worker. And that's it for Automate. Next slide, and over to Greg. Thanks, Tina. So on the platform side, we've merged 40 PRs, mostly bug fixes, uh, follow suit with everything else for the G-release. Um, some significant ones here. The, the first one there is very significant. So um, the guys, uh, Joe Raffinello, Nick Lamaro, Dennis, I think Jason, too, spent months trying to find this uh, memory leak on, this, on the server process. And they never gave up. You know, they were kind of tenacious with it. And they finally found what it is. And it was, as it usually turns out, it's a small change, but you know, difficult to, to find. Um, it had to do with uh, auto load paths and converting them to strings. Um, simple change uh, that addressed the memory leak. Um, Joe opened a, a bug with Ruby, and I think that um, is going to get backported. Um, and those are the PRs there as well. So that's, that's a huge one. Um, I think with you know with this change and this fix and the change that was made a couple of sprints ago to uh, the way we look at the worker memory, uh, the value we use for the thresholds, it's going to uh, make the overall appliance much more stable. Really happy about that. Real excited. Um, and actually, this this next fix has to do with uh, I think the thing that Tina was just talking about. Um, we made a slight tweak in the priority, the queue priority for authentication, authentication checking, um, so that um, it was basically normal priority, and we made it high priority so that if it's sitting on the queue, it would go before other things like a synchronous refresh. Um, we ran into an issue where there's a, like a bit of a deadlock uh, situation where a refresh was timing out because synchronous refresh was timing out because the credentials were not valid, but the messages for validation were getting pushed behind those requests. Um, and then Yuri made a uh, couple of fixes for custom button expression evaluation uh, there. Um, and uh, he also made a fix to the um, replication configuration page so that if the uh, or one of the remote databases that was in the subscription was not reachable, it wouldn't, it would wouldn't prevent the page from loading and prevent you from either deleting or updating a, a subscription. And Joe V did an upgrade of the net LDAP that we use uh, for internal LDAP support, client support. Um, there was a security fix in there, and he had to do some back-end work uh, because the new version of the gem um, changed the way IP addresses and host names uh, were being passed to, the, uh, to connect to the LDAP server. And he also fixed uh, an interesting bug um, in the external authentication uh, for how we do conversion for the user principal name. Um, there were some cases where um, the way it was being matched um, with the at sign in a domain name, we were basically 
some cases, adding add sign domain name at the end again when it was already there to fix that. That's pretty much it for the platform side. What happened? I think I lost the connection. That's all you need to know. <laughs> and maybe I won't. Is everyone still on a phone? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Okay. All right. Sorry, we just lost our. We lost the. Um, the 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 screen share. We also yeah. cannot see the screen share. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. All right, give me one second, and that should be it. All right, next slide, please. Can you do the rest? I'll do the rest. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Give it a rest. <laughs> so on the REST API side of things, uh, we had a couple of announcements that came in. Uh, the one by Erez, uh, we're adding support for being able to scan container images, and that's the standard scan action on the image uh, the resources, uh, showing here the standard post, and that returns the uh, action result signature. The success message and the test preference. Next slide, please. Okay, so one enhancement we made to the API was is that now we would return nil attributes. Um, so earlier, you know, since version one, nil attributes were not returned by the API. So that was for helping uh, response payload sizes, but it did confuse uh, quite a bit the callers saying, you know, I don't see this attribute. Where's that attribute? So we've uh, modified this so now, as you can see in this example, you know, you, you'll get attributes that are shown by JSON as null, and those will be nil in the, in the system. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one enhancement uh, by Jillian. Uh, there was a need to know the server time, um, and uh, what we've done is basically in the entry point um, we stash in the current time of the server that's processing the API request. And you'll see that in the server info hash, uh, shown here in italic, the time uh, in ISO 8601 format. Next slide, please. All right, and one other enhancement is for the patch support. <coughs> so, so uh, initially, we supported uh, the uh, a patch document shown here on the lower right um, part of the screen, which has basically an action and path for each of the attributes we wanted to edit. You can add, you can delete attributes, and so forth. But uh, uh, so we needed also a way to uh, to have a standard hash uh, uh, payload that comes in. So we support that here, shown as patch with a standard. Uh, a hash of attributes to change, and that's similar to what we uh, we do for the post on the added action. So, same payload that's now also supported in patch. And that's it for the API. Next slide, please. Already off to All right. For the GraphQL, for, for the, uh, GraphQL API, this sprint, we continued our work on supporting the relay specification for GraphQL APIs. Uh, this again is a specification that servers can implement so that Relay-supported clients already know exactly how a server handles things such as pagination. Uh, this sprint, we completed global object identification. So in this spec, every single node you fetch from the API is given a globally unique identifier, which conventionally is a base64 encoded string uh, containing the GraphQL query and the primary key. Uh, it's intended to be user opaque, which is why it's encoded. Uh, with this, you or your Relay client on your behalf can now specifically call any node in the entire graph individually. And this enables some seriously awesome client-side caching that Relay clients handle uh, since they now have a way to break caches and refetch individual nodes when appropriate. Uh, note that along with following this spec, the Postgres ID, which would be standard to use in something like the REST API is deprecated, uh, you don't actually use database primary keys in GraphQL as that's really an implementation detail. Uh, nonetheless, we've kept it available just as a convenience for getting used to GraphQL and being able to compare things to the REST API. And you'll note that this is something that uh, is done exactly like this in GitHub's GraphQL API. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that, so I'll be writing and talking more about that later. That's it. Next slide, please. Uh, we also do uh, queries via GET in the query string now. Uh, in GraphQL, in the specification, uh, you should be able to use a GET request as well. So looking at the 
example, simple query right there. The standard way to do it would be to post to the GraphQL endpoint uh, with a query key uh, or operation name, a bunch of other features. Uh, you can now do the same thing, except including the query in the query string for a get request. Next slide, please. Lastly, uh, Tim's doing a ton of work uh, looking at uh, graphical explorer integration. That's the, the user interface that I've been showing uh, a lot as we've been looking at GraphQL. Um, integrating that with the classic UI and actually building it and including it uh, with Manage IQ. Uh, that's currently still in progress, uh, making really good progress and should be done here in this next sprint. Uh, and lastly, we also added a bunch of integration test macros uh, and whatnot to the code base so that uh, you know contributors can more easily be able to, to write tests against uh, GraphQL queries. And that's it for GraphQL. Hi, for documentation in this sprint, we had 17 PRs merged, 13 of which were enhancements, four which addressed bugs. Uh, some highlights from this sprint are we've added a section on hiding environmental environmental variables. Uh, we've moved the VMware section and cleaned up some related language. There's a new procedure on adding and resuming container providers. Uh, removed older authentication information, and we've updated the Prometheus alerts metadata. Uh, that's it. Next slide, please. Okay, um, that's the end of Sprint 78. So our next uh, meeting is in two weeks, Sprint 79, February 14th, then the same time, same place. That's it. Thank you and have a good day. Can you bring this trumpet back next week? <laughs>